I want to pick up this week right where I left off last week. You guys were here last week. We talked about the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph ends, and if you haven't heard the story of Joseph, you got to read the story of Joseph. You can get online, get to our website, watch last week, and you'll see the whole story of Joseph. And then you can open up your Bible, and you can read the story of Joseph, and you can read some of the things that we didn't even talk about. And it's actually, it's not difficult to read. Joseph's story in terms of the Bible is a pretty small window of space. But Joseph's story ends at the first book in the Bible, Genesis, comes to an end with Joseph's story. You jump into the second book, it's Exodus. I want to look at that this morning. I want to look at Moses. How many of you remember Moses? How many of you know the story of Moses? Now, for some of you, it's Charlton Heston, right? It, it, it's, it's, some of you who are older, that's who, that's who we remember. But, but for some of you, it's Disney and it's Prince of Egypt. See, it, it's the same story. And, and I want to look at that this morning because what, what God, you're going to relate to Moses more than you. We think of Moses as the guy who did this unbelievable stuff. You're going to relate more with Moses than you could ever imagine. As we step into this, you're going to see what I mean. Let, 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 me just, let me just dive right into it here. I'll tell the story as quickly as I can. I'm only going to tell a part of it. You need to read this story. There's a part in this story where God gets so ticked off at Moses, he wants to kill him, okay? I'm not even going to touch that. There are other parts in this story about Moses we're just not even going to get into. So you need to open up. Do it tonight. Do it when you sit down in your bed or, or, or pick another time. But, but you got to read the story of Moses. There's so much in there that I, I just can't cover. But, but let me give you to the best of my ability. A new king came to whom Joseph meant nothing. A Do you remember last week the story of Joseph? Joseph actually saved the nation. Not only did he save the nation, he saved the surrounding nations. Some of the nations around Egypt, he, it was all because of Joseph's willingness to be obedient to God. And Joseph was the hero. He was Pharaoh's hero. He was the hero of the story in Egypt. And Egypt opened its arms wide to the children of Israel to come in. But then a new king, whom jo this, see, Joseph's generation had passed, and now it was a new generation. Let me tell you something. Our culture today is no different. We came as a nation. We came out of World War II, united as a nation. Republicans and Democrats, united as a nation. Basically, we had one perspective as a nation. And now, here we are in our current day culture. We could not possibly be more divided than we are right now. And it is not good for, as a matter of fact, our culture has changed so much that some of the things that's being talked about in the political arena, our, our previous generations who came out of World War II would, would be horrified that we're actually talking about some things. See, a new king who Joseph meant nothing to him. Because the culture had totally changed. The perspective of a nation had totally changed. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous. Even when God's children were in bondage, he blessed them. Over and over again, the Bible talks about being fruitful and multiply. That's God's design. Fruitful and multiply. Multiply. Take it all over the place. God's design, fruitful and multiply. They multiply. So, so, so Egypt, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, they, they ended up putting masters over them, the children of Israel, to oppress them with forced labor. Look what it says here. It says, forced labor, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and all kinds of work in the fields. The Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. I think there's real clarity here. Ruthlessly. 
The king of Egypt, listen to this. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Do you understand where this culture is? Do you understand how much disdain Pharaoh and the Egyptians had for the children of Israel? Do you also see some clarity in how cheap life can become when our perspective gets twisted? If it's a girl, let her live. Pharaoh made a big mistake here. You don't talk to the, his, the, the Hebrew midwives and say, I want you to take the life of a baby. These are a group of people who are committed to guaranteeing that life happens, that birth happens. Pharaoh made a huge mistake in telling them to take the life of every baby boy, and they didn't do it. Do you know why? Because they feared God much more than they feared men. They had a healthy respect for God. They had no respect for what they were hearing from the leader of the Egyptian nation, and they did not do it. Because their commitment was to their God. And when they didn't do it, the results were clear. The, the, the population kept growing. And so Pharaoh came. He called the midwives before him. And he said, why have you not done what I have asked? I'm telling you, you guys got to read this whole story. There's so much more in here. Why haven't you done what I've asked? They said, Pharaoh. Here's the truth. They lied. They lied. God's people lied, and he put it in the Bible. They said, these women are so strong. They're not like our women or like the Egyptian women. These women are so strong. Before we even get there, they have the babies, and, and, we're, and we, don't even, we don't know where they went. Pretty good, huh? Pharaoh gave this order after that. He gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw him into the Nile River. Clarity is just rolling itself out here where the culture is, where the Egyptian nation, where Pharaoh is. He gave this order, throw them into the Nile. That was the era that Moses is born into. That's what's going on when Moses is born. And then the Bible picks up in chapter 2 of Exodus, and Moses' mom and dad, and it says this, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. This is Noah we're talking about. You know what that means? Throw him in the Nile. Look what it goes on to say. She hid him for three months, but when she could no longer hide him, you know what she did? She got a basket, and she put pitch on this basket, just like they did in their day with boats, so it wouldn't leak. And she puts the baby, he wasn't named Moses yet, she puts the baby into this basket, and she sticks it in the Nile River, huh? Then puts the baby in the, and she sticks it amongst some of the reeds there. She just places it there. She hid him in her family for three months, and now he's in this little basket. She placed it among the reeds in the Nile. And then she took Moses' older sister and placed her right down nearby so she could watch and she could see what happens. Sometimes in our lives, church, we're, we're surrounded by evil or we're surrounded by a difficult situation, and we feel like there's nothing we can do. When you and I are placed in that, we need to do what Moses' mom did. You do whatever little bit you can do. That's what you do. Just whatever it is, whatever little bit that you can do. I grew up listening to my parents sing a song, Little as Much When God is in it. Amen. My mom played the accordion, and my dad played this old harmony acoustic guitar. 
And they would sing this song. Little is much when God is in it. Because little becomes much when God is in it. When everything seems impossible, God can do anything. His sister, she stood at a distance and she watched what was going to happen. And Pharaoh's daughter and all of her maidservants came down to the river Nile to bathe. It was just their custom, which is why Moses' mom put the kid in the basket, pushed him over there. You do what little you can do. Pharaoh's daughter sees the baby. Oh, it's such a cute little baby. How do you not respond that way? Well, she could have said, this is probably another one of those Hebrew boys and picked him out of the basket and flipped him in the water and let him drown because that's what was being done everywhere else in that culture. But Moses' sister walks up and she says, would you like me to see if one of the Hebrew women can raise him for you, can take care of him for you? Yes. Moses' sister goes and gets Moses' mom, Pharaoh's daughter, paying Moses' mom to raise Pharaoh. This is a deal. What do you do when it's extremely difficult and there's nothing to do? You do what little you can do. And then it goes on to say, when the child grew older, she took him Pharaoh's daughter, to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses. And that's how Moses got his name. God will make a way when there is no way. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's home. He grew up in the lap of luxury. There's nothing that he couldn't have. He grew up and got a great education. He grew up and he was, he was, an, he was an adult male probably somewhere in his 40s at that point. And Moses, knowing his mom was a Hebrew, but he was raised as an Egyptian, saw something happen. He saw an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew. And Moses looked to the left, looked, to the, looked around. Nobody saw this. Moses kills the Egyptian guy Drags him, basically buries him in the sand. But just like you and I know in our lives, when we turn to the left and we turn to the right and we think nobody's looking, somebody sees. Amen. And Pharaoh found out about it. And Pharaoh pursued and wanted to kill Moses. Moses flees. He goes out into the desert. He goes out into the desert in Medan, and he, and he stays there. And, and he, this whole next phase of Moses' life happens. Moses is out there in the desert, and he, and he, he, he comes across some, some women. And you've got to read the story. I can't tell you. The, you've got to read this part of the story. Here's the long and short of it. Moses marries this chick, right, who has six sisters, no brothers, his father-in-law is Jethro, has seven daughters, no sons. And Moses married probably the hottest chick in the bunch. I bet you that's what happened, right? Moses marries her. And this is no poor guy. He's, he's, got, he's got a whole, he's got cattle and sheep, and he's got this whole big spread, and he's got all of this. And, and Moses actually becomes a part of this family. As a matter of fact, he becomes the doer in this family. As a matter of fact, Moses is heir apparent here because, because there are no sons and, and, and Jethro has really taken a liking to Moses. And, and, and Moses is, he, he's not in the palace anymore, but he's in this life of comfort in the desert. And then in chapter 3, out there in the desert, God comes to Moses Moses is in the desert, and he sees this bush on fire. Goes over to the bush, and while it's on fire, it's not being consumed. And then God himself talks to Moses from this bush. Tells Moses, Moses, take your sandals off. Take your sandals off because I'm God, and this is holy ground. 
God gives all kinds of clarity to this whole situation. Give all kinds of clarity to Moses, letting Moses know who it is that's talking to him. And that the very fact that he is there speaking to him through a burning bush turns this whole area into holy ground because he is a holy God. Gives real clarity to Moses. And then God talks to Moses. He said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I see what they are going through. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land. I'm going to take them out of slavery and bondage and I'm going to put them in a great place flowing with milk and honey, which happens to be right now the home of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites. These are all enemies of the children of Israel. Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hevites and Jebusites and they're way too tight. I, I, I want to take my children out of bondage and give them freedom in a beautiful land. It's the very desire that God has for his people. Then he goes on to say, so now I'm sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And God gives this challenge to Moses. Moses comes to God, and he gives God all the reasons why he can't do this. I'm, I'm telling you, you are going to relate to Moses more than you could ever imagine, because I relate to Moses. God tells him why he can do it. And then God, over and over, goes, everything Moses, re- Moses, what's in your hand? A staff. Okay, throw it on the ground. Moses throws the staff on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And Moses does what I would do. He runs away from the sucker. Then God says to Moses, okay, touch it. I don't know. Well, I guess with God talking, maybe I would have done it. Snakes and I, no. So he obeys God. He touches the snake. It turns back into a staff. Moses is almost impossible to convince. God says, Moses... Put your hand inside your cloak. And Moses puts his hand inside his cloak. And God says, take it out. He takes it out. And his hand is covered with leprosy. That's a big deal in that day. God says, okay, put it back. He puts it back in and he pulls it out and it's perfectly normal. And then God goes, goes on to further give him things. And, and, and Moses, gives, God gives him so much to give so much clarity. And Moses still does not get there. And then Moses says to God, but I'm no good at speaking. Everybody knows that. See, and Bible scholars tell us that Moses had a, had a speech impediment. Moses says, I'm, I'm, I am no good at, at, at speaking publicly or even communicating at any level at all. And God says, okay, I'll give you your brother Aaron to speak for you. Moses finally agrees. He he finally agrees to do all of this, and, and he goes to Pharaoh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, and he says, he says, let my people go. And at the end of the whole deal, including 10 different plagues, and, and Pharaoh saying no so many times, he finally says, okay. And Pharaoh lets the children of Israel go, and Moses leads them out into the desert. And God takes care of them through this whole process. And and the the long and the short of it is, and I'll go into a little bit more of it, but they they get to the Red Sea, and, 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 and now it looks like there's a huge problem because the only place to go is to the Red Sea. And now they are ticked at Moses. Moses is questioning God. And, and, and look at what God has to say here. He says, Moses, this is Charlton Heston part. Raise your staff and your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. And he does it. And they do. And then the Israelites went through the sea on dry land with a wall of water on the right 
and a wall of water on the left. You guys remember that. If you're old, you remember this movie. And you remember that this was like the special effects thing of the day. This was a big deal that I think they did with Jello. But they did this whole effect. And then the, the army followed them down in between the walls of water. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And the Bible says not one of them survived. That's part of the story of Moses. Then the story goes on and the creator of the universe, God himself, calls Moses up to a mountain and God gives him him the Ten Commandments. That part of the whole story is crazy. you got to read it. And those Ten Commandments have shaped for thousands of years the world that we live in. God guided people with those Ten Commandments. John Maxwell, in his book, Running with the Giants, he quotes a little part where he's having a conversation with Moses. And he quotes Moses in paraphrase saying, the greatest moment of my walk with God, this is Moses talking, the greatest moment of my walk with God came at the burning bush. It was a decision that I struggled with. But when I finally was obedient, it wrote the next 40 years of my life. Moses. It is an amazing story of God's handiwork. But let's jump into it. Because Moses had to overcome some things in his life. Moses overcame his past experiences. He overcame every one of his past experiences. He was born into uncertainty. His mom pushed him out in a basket. Basically, his mom took him and she put him in the hands of God. Moms and dads, you couldn't have better advice than that with your kids. Amen. Placing our kids in God's hand. Doing, not shirking our responsibility, doing everything he calls us to do with our kids. But being willing to place them in his hands. Amen. Then he was taken by Pharaoh's daughter. And being taken by Pharaoh's daughter gave him a life of comfort and wealth, and everything that you could want in life. But a decision that he made took him out of that comfort. How many of us have had our lives changed in any given area by a decision that we made? This is real, church. And yet our gracious Heavenly Father has taken that and weaved it into the story of our lives. And if we let him, he will use it more than we could ever imagine. Because that's what he does. And Joseph flees into the desert over 40 years in Medan, in the desert. But he never forgot his experiences. But Joseph overcame all of his life experiences. Moses also overcame the comforts of his present life. He had gotten to the place in the desert where he was so comfortable. He was tending sheep. Life was easy. Look, this is having life being good is not a bad thing. We, we strive for this. We strive to get out of debt. We strive to get into the right relationships. We, we spend our energy to get there. That is not a bad thing. Jethro took, took Moses in. He, he was the heir apparent to this whole dynasty. He wasn't in the palace anymore, but he was certainly in a place of comfort, a comfort zone. And you and I, we desire to get in a comfort zone in terms of relationships. We're tired of messed up relationships, and we want to get into a good relationship. Our finances become a disaster. And we want to get our finances back to a good place. We're all about those things here. 
getting our relationships right, getting involved in a life group, get, serving in an area with a group of people, Financial Peace University, taking our finances and actually getting them to the place where we not only get out of debt, but we move forward in that process and getting every area of our financial life straightened out and then even moving towards building wealth. Whoa, I never thought about that. God has a plan for every area of our lives. Jethro took him in. But there's a danger with this comfort zone. I got to tell you, I'm challenged with this with our church. Because our church is right at, it is at this comfort level. It's at this success level. It's at this place where the bills are all paid every month. It's at this place where it's the right size and we have a perfect size staff and, and we can manage all this and, and we can all continue to grow together and, and we can develop relationships with one another. But, but then there's this tug of God pulling on Moses. And it's not just Moses. As we go through every one of these stories, one of the threads that I see is God pulling us out of our comfort zone into a faith zone. Because this is great. The, the first service, the second service, these are great. But you know what they're missing? I got to tell you this, church. They're missing the people in our lives and our community who don't know Jesus. They don't know that he loves them and cares about them and wants for them the same thing that he wants for us. He pulls, he's pulling Moses out of this comfort zone to this faith zone. Moses overcame his comfort zone. You know what else he overcame? You're going to love this. You're going to relate to this. He overcame his insecurities. Moses was dripping wet with insecurity. One of the most insecure people in the Bible. And yet he's the guy who we point to who God did all these big things. That'll take you from feeling useless to feeling usable. Moses overcame his insecurities. And God, in a burning bush, took him from his comfort zone and gave him a life mission that God had for him to accomplish. And Moses is no different than every single one of us here this morning. Because he's got a plan, and he's got a purpose, and he's got a life mission for every single one of us. For you, you, just as important as for me. Don't look up on this platform and think it's any different for me or anybody that was up here this morning than it is for you and what God has for you to do. From your comfort zone to your faith zone. He felt totally inadequate. Oh my gosh, that makes me feel good. He was so insecure about himself and about his future. Let me show it to you just a little bit, just in a few of the things he threw at God. Who, who am I that I should go? Who, who am I? And God says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Just so there's clarity here, God's saying to him, I am the eternal power. I am the creator of the universe. Amen. I made it all, you puny little twerp. I'm coming and want, I'm inviting you to be a part of this. You know, God is saying, it's me. Unchangeable character. God has an un, in an unchanging world that you and I flounder around in, God has an unchangeable character. And there's nothing he doesn't know, and there's nothing he can't do, and that just doesn't go for moments. That's for always. I am, he says. 
I am. What shall I tell them in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3? Tell them that I am has sent you. All powerful God, creator of the universe. You tell them that. That's after he went through all this stuff with changing the staff and his hand and all this stuff. Moses, I can do this. You just need to obey me. What shall I tell them? Tell them I am. The nature of God. The nature of God. You and I need to understand it is stable and it's trustworthy. In a constantly changing world, as you and I follow Christ, the nature of God is stable and it's trustworthy. And that's why you and I are free to follow him and enjoy what he is doing. We don't even have to stop to try and figure it out because of his nature. Stable, trustworthy. All we got to do is follow. Moses continues, what if they don't believe me? That's when God does the whole what's, thing, what's in your hand thing, throws the staff down, turns it into a snake, picks it back up, goes through all of this. But, but I have nothing to offer. And then he goes on, I've never been eloquent. I, I can't speak well. I have a slow speech of tongue. I've, I've got this speech impediment. And God's, you know, God's got to be at this place where he's saying, oh, for my sake, what am I going to do with this guy? <laughs> and then to top it off, after all of this, Moses says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 3, Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send somebody else. Now, there's a clear picture of Moses. Does that not make you feel comfortable about yourself? And God did amazing things with this twerp. Amazing things. Every time Moses raises an excuse to God's call, God answered it thoroughly. And Moses was still afraid. We don't, we don't think about that when we see Charlton Heston going like this and the waters are up. We don't think about that. But that's the real Moses. And if Moses were here today, he would look you and I square in the in face and he would encourage us. And he would build us up and he would challenge us and he'd give us wisdom. And he would say, real growth begins when you leave the safe zone and you get into the faith zone. That's when real growth happens. He didn't want to leave the palace. He said, but you know what? If I never left the palace, I would never have experienced the burning bush and a face-to-face -face with God himself. Had to leave the comfort zone to get into the faith zone. He didn't want to leave Medan, but if I didn't leave Medan, I would have never seen the Red Sea get parted in front of me. I, I would never be a part of, of, of what God has placed here for everyone all, all the way through history to see. It, it raises this question for me and for you. Is there something that you don't want to do that you know that you should do. Is there an area, listen, I'll, I'll tell you that knowing that in every single one of our lives, there's a step forward that he wants us to take in any given area in our, some of us it's in the area of finances, some of us it's in the area of our relationships, some of us it's in the area of serving, some of us, it's in all of those areas. Is there something, every, every miracle that happened with Moses happened after he took a step. We live in this world, this, this is us, we want to say to God, okay God, when you do this, I'll do this. We, we, we. We 
look square in the face of our Creator, and we tell Him that by our actions and by the way we live our lives. And God is saying, take a step. It may be, here's the reality. The steps in our lives are little step, little step, little step, little step. Whoa, that's a big one. Little step, little step, little step. Most of the steps in our lives are little steps. I don't, I don't know what it is God said, but that, that question almost rattles my teeth. Because I know in all of our lives, he's saying, there's something that you should do, and you know you should do it. Moses would encourage us. He would say, the safe zones rob us from our greatest moments and memories. The the safe zones, the not taking the step, robs us from our greatest moments moments, and our greatest memories. Take the step. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of John Maxwell. He's, he not only was a pastor for years, but he, he's a leadership guru. Look what John says here. He says, you can't stay the same and learn at the same time. You can't stay the same and learn at the same time. If you want to grow, you need to go. Safe zone, the land of just enough. God wants more for you. He wants to take you out of the wilderness. He wants to place you in the promised land. Years from now, here's here's the truth, people. Years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the risks you didn't take than by the ones that you did take. I look back at the risks I have taken in years past and the ones that I even messed up in. Here's what I know. God took those and taught me something from them and, and used them in my life and actually used them for his glory. You say, well, James, I, I, I got nothing to I've done everything wrong. Great. If you've done everything wrong, you come up and you'll be a great example of what not to do. God, in every way. For you, I don't know where that is. I don't know if that's in your finances. I don't know if that's in your relationship. It's probably in more than one because I can relate to that. But the creator of the universe is saying to you, go, take that next step. Stand with me this morning. I want to pray with you. Church, here's what I know. This is his family. This is the group that he has put together. We're his children. He's at work in our lives. We we are living this. We are doing this. And so many of us, we get Moses' perspective, and we feel so inadequate. And that's okay. There's some times that I feel so inadequate. But he's at work, and this is his church. And there's not one of you here this morning that he doesn't love more than anything else he has created. He loves each one of us with that kind of love. And he showed it. He showed it when he sent his son in this broken world to pay a price for our sins. Because even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it because there's nothing that we could offer to a holy and a perfect God whose very nature is love. Let me close in prayer this morning, and let me also challenge you. If you've never accepted him as your Savior, I just want to invite you to that this morning. I don't know if you notice this, but I'm trying to do this almost in every service. And maybe you've, you've walked away in your relationship with God and you're kind of distant and you, you feel incredibly inadequate. It's okay. Because this is God we're talking about. And you're the apple of his eye. 
and he paid the price, all you need to do is believe and turn, repent and follow him. And he will do things in your life you never, ever even dreamed possible because it is what he desires to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessing on our church family. Thank you for your presence here this morning. And if you're here this morning and you've never made that decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, I just want to give you that invitation. That happens when you simply believe. When you believe that Jesus was sent by God as his son. He came as a baby. We celebrate Christmas. On, on Easter, we celebrate the fact that he willingly gave his life up. They nailed him to a cross. They put him in a grave. And on the third day, he rose from the dead to make sure there was unbelievable clarity on who he is. And he paid the price for our sins. If you've never accepted him as your Savior, you can do that this morning by just believing in the name of Jesus and his sacrifice for your sins and for mine. And just for my sake, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you did that this morning, if you believed that this morning, just simply put your hand up, put it right down as everyone else is praying this morning. Yes, 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 yes. Lord, this is a special moment, yes. Father, thank you for the five hands that went up. Thank you for the hearts that openly accepted you as their Savior this morning. As a church family, we celebrate with them. Knowing not, knowing not only that they're gonna, but we together are going to be with you in heaven, but that we're a part of a family here. And they're now a part of that family where you are at work in our lives. We celebrate that with them this morning. Father, bless our church family as we step outside these doors and we take this message through today, through Monday, through Tuesday, through all the way through till next Sunday. Be with us in that we ask. In your precious and holy name, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.